So, Vinny, thank you so much for joining me. Season two of the Curious Cult Show, um, where we are talking about starting things. Um, and I couldn't think of anyone better from my past and um, someone I've been very uh, in awe of over the last 15 years. Um, so thank you for joining me. Nick, great to be here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Cool. So um, to kick things off, I always ask my guests to introduce themselves. Um, I think you know yourself better than I know you. So why don't you tell my listeners and viewers who you are and why they should be listening to you? Sure. So I'm just a you know a garden variety South African, um, you know, <laughs> born in East London, uh, raised there, and uh, moved to Cape Town, studied UCT, moved to Johannesburg, worked there in corporate world for about you know, nearly four years. Um, and then I, you know, I left to start my first uh, company. It was a search engine marketing platform back in 2003. It's still around today, just to customers. And then I, I created a series of other businesses like Incubator as well uh, and, and uh, Synthesize, which became Yola. Uh, so that's kind of one of the, the sort of, you know, original starting point in South Africa. Uh, I moved to um, Silicon Valley with, with Yola in 2008, spent a couple of years there building it out. Uh, left in 2011. Started uh, Gift, which is a mobile gift card platform. Two thousand twelve, sold that to First Data. Um, you know, just over fifty million dollars, except in you know two two years with five million dollars raised. So it's pretty good turnaround. Um, and then I started Civic in two thousand fifteen. Uh, it's a global digital identity platform. Um, we're doing, you know, a lot of things, especially now in the era of COVID. So we're looking at uh, health passports, etc. But it's it's an identity platform at its core. Um, and I would have actually had a different insight maybe a year ago before COVID uh, around digital identity than I have now. Um, and I'm happy to chat about that later, but that's been an interesting run. I also started a VC fund called uh, Newtown Partners based in Cape Town, manages about $20 million for Imperial Ventures, um, Imperial Logistics Ventures. And, um, you know, I've invested in about probably a hundred companies, um, some notable ones. Um, Lots of successes and failures in that portfolio, but overall, um, just a massive um, ROI on the on the winners. And some of my winners have been, you know, 60, 66 times return on investment in you know two years, uh, and then others have been gone to zero. Crazy. But that, but that's the game you play. Yeah. You, you 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 play for the winners, not the not the losers. And as long as you can balance out your portfolio, that's great. I've also done Shark Tank in South Africa and Dragons Den. Um, <laughs> So the South African community knows me as one of those, you know, entrepreneurs, come investors, and uh, yeah, uh, probably a whole bunch of other things I'm forgetting about right now. But I've done a lot, and I'm um, you know following the world. So I'm at the uh, the last sort of third of my my active uh, working life. Um, oh please, I can't see you stopping for another forty years. Yeah, uh, forty years would be too much. But I, I probably have another good yeah. uh, d decade or two left in me, and then I'm gonna sort of. Uh, you know, and taper it off a bit. Fair enough. Um, cool. So yeah, that was a great intro. Um, and it's been incredible to like peg uh, the, the series of things. I mean, I was physically present when you announced Synthesite in South Africa um, at that very first 27 dinner all those years ago. And uh, then it became Yola, obviously. So crazy journey that um, I've been able to watch. So um, you, you were obviously for, it's... The, sorry, you were there for the launch of Silicon Cape as well, right? So Justin and I did that. Yeah, I was I was there for the launch of Silicon Cape. And um, I was actually, myself and Vincent, were the first Silicon Cape startup founders who moved to Cape Town off the back of Silicon Cape. Yeah. So I've been right on your coattails all the way along. Um, it's, the, it's been the, an interesting the, trip, man. The energy in that room that day was amazing. I remember it was, it was just... Phenomenal. Honestly, unforgettable. Yeah. I, I actually vividly remember where I was when you and Justin were making the announcement in that room. Um, so, I mean, that's another exact great example of you just start stuff. Um, and that's the theme for today's conversation, right? Um, so I want to go back to relatively early in your life. Um, do you remember something from your teens, childhood uh, that was difficult to start, that you had trouble with, um, that you kind of cut your teeth on? Because obviously you said you started Incubator, that wasn't your first thing ever, right? Um, what, what was it that got you kicked off? You know, it's a good question. I, I don't actually know like what my, my sort of you know, origin uh, you know, was like in terms of being an entrepreneur. Like, if I go really far back when I was six, six, seven years old, eight years old, was it? I think it was seven, eight years old, I started buying like Thundercat stickers and packs. 
and recognizing that I, you know, like I want the gold ones, but I don't want the silvers and the other ones. And I would like buy the packs, get those ones, and then sell the others and make money to buy more packs. And it's like <laughs> this never ending sort of you know story. Uh, and then the, yeah. that was the first exposure to making money, right? Like, oh, so I sell these, I make money, and I can actually make a profit and <laughs> the, the stuff that I already bought. And that was like a young age. And then, you know, throughout my career, I was like, uh, I was just doing odd stuff at university and, and high school. Like just, you know, I, at university, I, I had a, a rock band management company. I was like managing a rock band literally back in the 90s. And like, I, I would go and... Um, uh, you know, get artwork designed for the, the gig. I would have a pr- like 500 posters printed, go hire some guys to go put posters up, you know, rent the venue, take the risk on the rental. Crazy. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. I used to run concerts and events at like Hard Rock Cafe in Cape Town. And uh, and I did all the marketing online. So I was at the, you know, the, the IRC chat rooms, like posting, like, you know, meetup yeah, and yeah. events and people would, would attend there. It would be great. Shit, remember IRC, man. Slap you with a salmon. Yep, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. Um, okay, that's really interesting. Um, so I don't know if anyone's ever asked you this, but was there ever an alternative for you to starting stuff? Because like, it seems like you always just started things. You had an idea and you did them. Was there ever an alternative? Or like, do you remember there being a choice? Like, okay, I'm choosing to start things, not to go the traditional route. Yeah, at one stage, I mean, so like in 1998, uh, the emerging markets crisis hit and what happened was uh, interest rates went to 26% or something. My dad's business was in trouble and I went back, to, I dropped out of university and he was like, I just couldn't afford to study, couldn't afford to stay there. And I went to help him build it up and kind of fix it up. So oh. it's a long journey there. It was, about a, it was the longest year of my life, but um, you know. Uh, it, in East London. In East London, yeah. So it, it was a very long, difficult journey, but you know, I made lots of mistakes. I had no idea what I was doing back then. So it was, it was a, a difficult time. But uh, I try to start up a um, you know franchise of the business. I try to do like a manufacturing, like you know food manufacturing side, frozen foods. Did a whole bunch of things in, in like a year. All failed. Um, lost some of yes. money, and um, you know kind of just moved on. Moved to moved to Johannesburg at that point. Um, so that was like a, a lost year. But I learned I learned a lot. That was a lost year. And when I moved to Johannesburg, I was like you know credit card debt, twenty years old, no money. Like what do I do? So get a job. <laughs> so that you know, that was a time where, like, you know, when you when you're in debt, when you when you um, you don't have cash and you need income, you get a job. And so I, I totally empathize with people who have a job. And and I've been there for I was there for like three and a half years. And it got to the point where you know I was 23, 24 years old, and I realized, look, I got to try and start a company. And if I don't do it at that point, I'm never going to do it because eventually. You get married, you have kids, you have commitments, house, mortgage, cars, all that stuff. And you get you get stuck in the golden handcuff trap, you know? You're like, you can't leave because you're getting paid so well. And um, and if you leave, your cash flow goes out. So I learned a lot. I've actually a lot of reflections on cash flow for people. Uh, but, you know, uh, and then I you know, did the, the usual young South African thing, bought myself expensive cars and, and got stuck in a little yep. trap again. So now I'm in the corporate world. I'm driving you know, expensive, you know, Mercedes Benz and whatever else and living in Ilovo. And, and then I was like, I just got, this is a trap and I had to get out. So I sold my yeah. little townhouse that I had made like a hundred and something thousand Rand back then. And I just plowed it into my new business idea, which was to see customers and it worked. And that was the end of that. Amazing. Do you remember, um, the specific event that triggered you going, no, oh, fuck, this is, this is not the thing, this corporate lifestyle, the, the race, the rap race, um, let me take this turn. Like, was there a moment or was it just this gradual evolution of things? So let, I'll, I'll give you a perspective on this, which is interesting. So I, I spent in the corporate world, so I, I found a job I really liked, okay? And I worked my butt off. I mean, I literally worked 18 hours a day, probably you know, 16 to 18 hours a day every single day. And this is on a salary basis, so you don't get paid more. So it's not overtime. Yeah. Okay? But yeah. <laughs> the, most, the most important thing is to be working in a job where the information and the data is changing every single day. So you're learning. Because like if you work as a bank teller or selling you know, burgers at McDonald's every day, you don't learn anything new the next day. It's the same thing. So yeah. So if you work in a not if you work in a repetitive process business, hours don't matter. If you work in a business where it's dynamic and things are changing and you're learning new things every single day, you need to maximize those hours. You need to just put you need to like just plow in as many hours. So I, like I had this weird thought when I was that age. If I work twice as hard as everyone else around me, I'm gonna learn twice as fast 
in a, in a, in a business where the data is changing, right? And so I did that. And I, I basically got to the point where I knew more than people above me. And then the people mm-hmm. above me in the organization started telling me things and I'm like, this is not how it works. And, and I could explain, yeah. you know, I could really like explain in detail why they were wrong. And then I started realizing, hang on, like I'm smarter than the people around me. And, you know, and it's because I've worked hard and I've like effectively worked, you know, eight years. I went like, you know, and so you look at a scale, like you're, you're a lot smarter, more experienced at a younger age than people who have been there doing the same repetitive tasks over and over. And even something like management is a repetitive task to, to some degree. So if you actually develop really speci- specialized skills in a certain area and you, and you raise yourself to, especially a new industry that's emerging, you become an expert in that industry. You can find a gap in the market and start your own business, but you know, you, you should never you should never uh, conflate like um, uh, working time with uh, you know, experience with knowledge. Right, they're two different things. Mm-hmm. So, like having being very knowledgeable and having lots of experience is not the same thing. And so, you should always try to be more knowledgeable because uh, you know, and and this is the this is the trap. It's like you go try and get a job. It's like oh, you don't have enough work experience. Which is like a kind of a, a recruiter's fallacy. You know, they look at your, your resume. Yeah. So I applied for maybe a hundred jobs in, in, in South Africa at the time, got declined for pretty much all of them. It was I really struggled getting a job in Johannesburg. I really struggled because I was so wow. I was so young. I was like 21, 22, 23. It was always like, yeah, you know, even though I understood the internet better than anyone at that point and I had so much knowledge of the internet and and and, and um, you know, I studied, you know, information systems at varsity. I, I, I had a really good deep skill set. They looked at my age and my years of experience and they equated that with knowledge. And so when you see that, so what happens is there's this like gap in the market. So when it comes to being an entrepreneur and starting a business, like you know something that people just don't know, don't appreciate, and they judge you based upon time versus what's in your mind. That's when you can start a business and you can take advantage of that gap. That's a great insight for anyone who hasn't started a business that's listening to this. But I think what's an important observation is a lot of like born and bred entrepreneurs, they kind of um, put their nose up at getting corporate experience, but there is value in getting corporate experience. The right type of corporate experience. So again, don't, don't go and work in a, a bank and be a teller. Okay, that's not going to change your life. Yes. Okay, don't, don't go. Yeah. You, uh, you, you need to look at your day every single day and realize that if you want to get ahead in life, you need to be in a job function that is different every single day that's changing and the, the amount of repetitive tasks are down to, I would say, if you're doing repetitive tasks that take up more than 20% of your time, you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong business, okay? Because that, that is like something that's gonna be automated. Anything that is repetitive will be automated by a machine in the next five to 10 years and you'll be out of a job. Spot you're out of a job anyway. So you need stuff which is non-repetitive and that the more hours you put into that job, the more you learn. So like an experience, experiential yeah. learning sort of environment. So the environment is very important. And this is why I, like, I always tell people that I, I have a lot of respect for artists, artists and, and creators and designers, et cetera, because that will never be replaced by machines. It's just too- it, it, It's that soft touch. The soft touch stuff. And, 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 and those skills are gonna become more and more valuable over time. The ability to find great UX designers, UI designers, um, that is something which is just not gonna, Thinking. No, 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 don't get me wrong. Like there'll be, there'll be machine learning that gets applied to design over time. So you have like mm. five different variants and then see which one works better. That's different from the core design and understanding what the need is. So, so people with a higher level of thinking like designers uh, are going to be extremely valuable. And if you're a designer, then you need to spend more time becoming just the best designer you can be understanding UX elements, understanding how, how AI is going to play into your world and just become the top of your industry. But, but the most important thing is I see too many people who are ambitious and not willing to work hard. You have to have both. Mm-hmm. So you have to be able to say, am I in an environment where 80% of my time is non-repetitive and I'm learning? And then can I double the amount of hours I put in every day and do that for three to five years and you'll be amazed what can happen. Yeah, I completely agree. You did mention, and I like the balance of um, work smart, work hard. You can't only work smart and you can't only work hard. But I'm curious on your opinion on this premise of work-life balance, because my view is that I don't really believe in it. I think if you're balancing something, you're at 50-50, not at 100. What's your view uh, now that you're a bit older and you've got some exits behind you? Is there anything like a work-life balance for people trying to really succeed at a top level? I, yeah, I don't believe it is. I, I think work-life balance is a fallacy um, when it comes to if you're trying to create wealth, you can't have a work-life balance because the opportunities that present itself don't care about your life. 
That's great. Well said. Um, when you look back on your career, is there anything that you can remember that scared you off from starting something or were you just completely fearless at every turn? You just did everything that came to you? You know, one of the things which, which comes from growing up in South Africa, I think is I have too conservative a mindset sometimes. And, and that's because okay. the risk of something being taken away from you is high, whether it's theft or whatever else. Um, and even in the business world, the business world, you know, the corruption that was already high in South Africa. So you, you're a lot more guarded and scared about things. And when you translate that to other countries you live in America, different levels of corruption here, for sure. There's corruption in every country. And a, but, you know, the, the mindset is very different here. There's a lot more of a growth mindset and an exploratory mindset where you, you risk it all, you put it on the line, and if you lose it, you can restart or whatever. Um, and, and I think in South Africa, the conservative mindset holds everyone back. We, we have this, like... A, a scarcity mindset and America's got an abundance mindset. Abundance mindset. And, and that's, the, that's the big difference. And it took me a long time to adjust from scarcity to abundance. Um, and in some ways, I'm still not fully adjusted to it. I still have my hang-ups about certain things. Um, and, and, and mm. you know, it's, it's one of those things where it just, it's the nature of where we come from. It's like part of our roots and our DNA. It'll hold us in good stead in certain times, but in other times, we'll be told detriment. So we'll, we'll never sort of you know, uh, like you look at guys like Elon, right? He's got this abundance mindset. He just like, you know, makes it happen. He has this like fearless thing. And that's because he, he left South Africa when he was 18. He didn't get influenced by the business world in South Africa, which has got a conservative mindset. I left when I was 28, 29. So my, my former years were yeah. not like Elon's. Uh, and so when he does things, I'm still like, whoa, that's sort of mind broken. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, what are you thinking? But even that, that's after I've adjusted to being in the US and I'm a dual yeah. citizen now, and I, you know, like I, I have a, a bit, a bit of appreciation for the way he does things and what he does in this mindset. But I can tell you now, like if I go back in, in time and all things are many equal, change any one thing, and let's just assume that like my personal life will be the same, right? Meet the same friends, etc. And like because you otherwise change one thing, yeah. you have a butterfly effect. But let's assume that you know, without having the, a personal butterfly effect in my life, in, in terms of career, the one thing I would have done differently. And I can tell this to any South African right now is I would have left South Africa I have left when I was 18. If I could have, whatever, I would have yeah. gotten into university overseas. I would have moved and studied in, in America, in particular, probably in Silicon Valley, um, you know, but, but any, any, any sort of good U.S. school and, and then started my career. Yeah, because I, I spent eight, 10 years in South Africa and I feel those years were wasted in my sort of both my, my look, look, UCC was great. Relatively, relatively speaking. UCC was great. Now, I probably wouldn't change those years. But maybe, maybe I would have been like, okay, you still was great. Spend, you know, do finish my third year, uh, and then or do post grad yeah, overseas. You know, so like it's okay to spend a couple. Of years Same there, feeling. I, but I should have left at twenty one. I should have left in in two thousand four when I started to see customers. I should have just set up a subsidiary and moved across. I should have done all those things. But the point is, you know, the, the it's but you know, remember, it's what you want out of life. Like if you want the family, you want the social. There's I get up a lot in South Africa. I miss South Africa a lot. I miss the rugby, I miss mm. the bries, I miss the, the people. I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff which you miss, but I'm speaking purely from a career perspective. Um, you know, yeah. I, I, it would have been better for me to have been in America because my mindset would have been different. I spent many years agonizing on like the, what works, the, you know, think about that, what works in South Africa in terms of a mindset doesn't transfer easily to other parts of the world. You've got to make an adjustment. So uh, with that said, if you had to give me some insights on what helped you shift your perspective from scarcity to abundance, can you tell us anything that you've learned to kind of click people into that yeah, mindset? Yeah, so one, one thing is like, um, you've got to know when to change gears and you've got to know when to have uh, risk on and risk off appetites. And I think the one thing which I, the advice I will give young entrepreneurs right now is no matter how much money you make, you, if you don't, if you, if you're not very, um, uh, acutely aware of your cash flow as a young person, <laughs> you will suffer and you will lose out opportunities. Your personal cash flow or Both. business cash flow? Both. So, so on, but okay. I think the personal one is probably more, more important. Okay. You will never earn enough money. The more money you earn, the more you will spend. It's as simple as that. Whether you're spending it on investments or whether you're spending it on personal stuff, you'll always spend it because 
money just gets money flows and it gets deployed so one of the key lessons i've learned is um you've got to keep your your overhead low and you got to match your income with your expenses so when you go into a new startup even if you've made money in the previous one you've got to readjust your your income your, your expenses you can't live in the same way you did when you started a new company now and, and there's lots of reasons for this I'm not, I, I, like i i think i don't want to focus on the reasons, but I, I think the the key insight that i'm willing i'm willing to share here is make sure that you are you living within your means if you're in a corporate job and you're getting well paid and you, you know you've got you know like always keep 12 months cash in the bank especially COVID should have taught everyone that by now 12 18 months cash in the bank you got to keep that in the bank and then if you're doing something high risk you have to reduce your expenses it's just simple as that um, do not keep it high expenses because it'll always take you longer than you think to start the business to get to profitability to get to this point so just always manage cash flow and 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 you know if you want to have the abundance mindset it's kind of weird like the, you know, i'm saying hey you know be frugal because you know in order to be abundant but the reason is that you know abundance comes from delayed gratification and when you delay gratification it costs you money if your cash flow is negative and then it creates stress and pressure on you which you don't want to have and i've made this mistake many times in my life that's why i'm able to speak about it like i just it's you know, you, you know, like every entrepreneur, I mean, Elon's made it, right? He, he sold PayPal and he's borrowing money for rent. Um, like, you know, yeah. and, and I know yeah. we like to cut it close as entrepreneurs, but the, the key point yeah. is that you've got to match income with expenses. And, and, and even though, because like all that prevents that is your ego. So your ego is what prevents you from, mm. oh, like if people think I'm downscaling to a smaller house or getting rid of my fancy car, they're going to think I'm doing badly in life, etc. It, it doesn't matter. That's your ego. Okay, you need, you need to do what yep. you need to do to get your business to be successful. And what your business doesn't need is for you to be a tax on the business when it needs the cash for growth. So no matter who you are, you've mm -hmm. got to make sure that you're within a certain limit and you maintain cash flow um, in your business because it's going to take you longer than you think to get to where you want to go. Yeah, it's an interesting um, counterpoint to the abundance is that you actually need to have restraints to be abundant. Like you, you can't spend endlessly and then think you're being abundant. That's the converse oh, of what really? it actually is. Um, I'm trying to tell young entrepreneurs that there's two ways to make wealth, right? To earn more or spend less. But it, like, it, 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 it's that's... actually more nuanced than that, Nick. Like the, 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 the point of actually yeah. spending less and having a, a more frugal budget is simply that you can delay gratification for longer. So when opportunities, so as an example, yeah. and I made this mistake in the past, like in 2000 and Eight, I had a really good opportunity to, I had shares in a company, uh, which, but I needed the cash because my cash flow was, personal cash flow was negative. I just moved to the US, I needed cash. If I sold those shares, uh, I would have made 10 times the money if I held them for another two or three years. Got it, that's a good point. So because you, if you had spent less, you would have needed less, you could have held on to those shares, delayed the gratification. Yes. And delayed the gratification, it's like, you're like your, your living expenses are a tax on your wealth. Always remember that, okay? So if you're taxing your wealth, you, you effectively well tax your wealth down to zero, you know, on an annual basis if you keep if you keep taxing it. So you've got to make sure that if you want to preserve wealth, that you can have investments that you don't have to touch for years. Like one of my best one of my best investments right yeah. now is one I made in 2014. Okay, so that's six years, and I haven't, okay. you know, even though I've needed the money at some point, I haven't touched it, and the, the ROI is like a hundred and something times its money. Okay. And so that becomes a lot of money. Mm. But if I, you know, if I could have, or I did sell, or whatever, I would have made the returns. So, like, the, what America gets right is like people get to a, a cash flow neutral situation where they have just enough money to survive and they live, etc. But they're able to allow their assets to grow, and equities, whatever else. And that's what the U.S. stock market does so well because people put money into four hundred one k's, etc. And they defer delay gratification. Yeah. So, so you know, the the, the spending mindset. You know, it works if you're living in a corporate. It doesn't work in the startup world where you're making your own investments and stuff because you're reliant on your own uh, personal cash flow. I would even argue that now what COVID's proven to everyone is even in a corporate mindset, in a corporate world, your career well, is no the, longer safe. Like the big businesses so aren't the, always going to save you. In the corporate world, you have enough, you should have enough cash flow positive money, like, you know, to have built a, a cash fund, hopefully. You should. You should, and then you've yeah. got you know you got labor laws and stuff that can protect you, so you get a couple of months worth of cash. But it doesn't it's not it's not wealth create like it's not an abundance mindset. You're still dependent on the corporate for your job, and anything can change with that. Yeah, 
It's hand it's to mouth. Time. And so, like, if you want to become really wealthy, you have to yeah. live like a pauper, literally. You have to, like, scrounge around for cash. Yeah. You have to keep it tight and, you know. And once you've made it, you can go buy the nice house. You can get the nice car. You can live off your assets a bit, you know. But even then, like, I, I still I still live within a, a certain bound. Like, you know, I still, like... Even then, yeah. you care less about it, right? Yeah. Once you've got the abundance, you kind of don't really want yeah, seven exactly. But you know, it's not even about that. Like even now, I, I, you know, I, I still my salary from 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 Civic is not, yeah, you know, it's like a market related salary for a startup entrepreneur. I don't like you know the the rest of my of my things that's the money on comes out of my wealth. So I'm using my wealth to subsidize the yeah. fact that I've spent twenty years building wealth, and even though I'm running. A, a startup, I can't yeah. tax the startup for my lifestyle, so it's got to come from somewhere. So I can dig into my wealth for a couple of years somewhere. because I, you know, I believe in what I'm doing, etc. And I've got other income sources as well. So I, I'm, you know, for me, it's a little bit different because I've created other income sources of wealth. And if I'm in a startup, that I can I can take a low salary in that startup. Yes, but you spent many years getting to that point. And I was talking to um, CEO of a company called LifeCheck, and he gave me this really interesting perspective. When you're young, everyone says to you, you should diversify your income streams and make passive income. And he said, yeah, passive income is for the wealthy. If you are broke or you're living hand to mouth, you can't yeah. build passive income because you need wealth to invest in the things that provide right. you passive income. So it's this uh, interesting perspective that most people just think, oh, I must get to passive income. Yes, you can't do that by spending money. You have to lower exactly. your expenses. Really interesting perspective, this cash flow thing. And I think it's quite a pivotal um, point. I talk to young startup founders all the time about cash flow. It doesn't matter what business you're in. Every business suffers with cash flow. That's just the way it is. Uh, Amazon all the way through to the smaller street sellers. Like that's their concerns. Um, okay, so when you starting out in a business and obviously you've started many what is the thing you focus on more the detail or the big picture i always focus on the big picture first to be honest um because you, you know, if you're going to spend and dedicate a couple of years of your life on something you, you better be certain that it's going to be um uh you know there, there, there's something bigger like like why would i go into a business that's got a, a, a that's got a maximum market opportunity of like a million bucks a year or five million bucks a year revenue. Like, I, like I, it doesn't make sense to me, right? I, I've got to go after opportunities which are 100 million, a billion a year. Like, I've, I've got to, I have to go after the bigger ones because otherwise I'm not going to make a dent in my wealth. Um, so, so that's so, so you got to start, I think, with the big picture to some extent. Now, it's different for different people, right? If you're starting up, you should just follow your passions, you know, like get your first million, get your first five, get your first 10. Like gift, I built up to 120 million bucks in sales in the first you know, three or four years um, from, from an idea to mm. you know, a pretty big business. Um, and so, you know, but before I'd, before I'd done that, I hadn't done anything at that scale yet. So you have to learn how to get, how to scale a business to that level. So, you know, start small and, 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 and build up on that. Makes sense. Um, would you consider yourself a curious person by nature? Not, not enough. I think I'm, I'm not, I'm not curious enough. Okay. Um, I, 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 so, so how do you kind of I find new things? World. Well, I'm curious about like, I, I tinker, I like tinkering. Um, but I, I think I need to be more curious in the world right now. And I'm going through like a, a new, a new phase of my life where I'm, uh, becoming more curious about things. And you, 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 okay, know, why, a new phase? you know why, like, uh, I think when I started off in the internet world, I was very curious about the internet and learned as much as I could about it and everything from like DNS to IPsec, like, like very detailed stuff. And I kind of went higher and higher. And then I look at the application layers and then you look at how Amazon's built and Google's built, et cetera. And then you become less curious about the, the details and more about sort of visionary stuff, where is it going? And when you look at what's next for the world right now, what are the areas of interest that I, I think um, are going to go mainstream? Um, you know, you have to question and be more curious about other things, I think. Um, and there's a lot of things I'm curious about that are kind of outside the scope of this, this podcast, which I'm, I'm going to explore. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the impact of COVID on humanity is going to be felt for years to come. And so now I'm, I'm curious about like what, what, what human behavior has changed. How do we change the way we do things? And so I'm going to mm. explore some ideas in that area as well. I think it's uh, it's good to be curious. I like I think one of the things the mistakes I made, 
when I was younger, I was too curious. And I was just bouncing around from idea to idea. Yeah. I became known as like an ideas guy and not an execution guy. And I quickly changed that by executing. But then, you know, you get so focused on execution mm. that you realize that you lose the you lose the, the childlike innocence when you're trying to be curious because I was kind of scared that people would see me as a distracted individual. Um, I mean, you, and then you look at Elon, like he's got, like you just keep starting companies and he's curious and curious about them. And that's a, that's a healthy thing. So I think, I think in life it goes, probably goes through some sort of waves where you, you are, um, uh, you know, you focus on execution and then you kind of, t you know, like wind it back to be more curious. And so there. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting that um, when you're in life, like in the midst of it, you don't realize these cycles. But when you're out of them, you look back like, I don't know, when I was in my 20s, I didn't see the cyclical nature of things. Now that I'm nearing 40, uh, a few years away, but still, you start to see that there are these like cycles, maybe five years to seven years to 10 year cycles where, you know, you can build something for a long mm -hmm. period of time and that's okay. Um, when you're in your 20s, you want to do things rapidly and get everything up and done. So, yeah, I agree. I think there are these interesting yeah, cycles. I think it's all the time for reflection now, now that I'm in my 40s. I mean, I just need to reflect on things mm -hmm. and look at things from a different view, new lenses, uh, reset my, you know, the way I think about things. So, I, I'm very happy. It's, it's, it's a point of introspection. I think, like, conversations like this are very interesting and, and inspiring for me because um, uh, I think that we, right now in the era of COVID, it's just very hard to get this human interaction. Like you and I know each other in person, right? So it's a lot easier just to have this mm. conversation. You know, we found out in person. So yeah. it's, it's, but like, how do you make new connections to people? How do you create new social networks where you, you can't go to a bar and meet someone. You can't go hang out with friends. You can't go to friends' houses and they invite, like we, you know, we hang out with people we know. And like, it's, it's like this family and us and like in San Diego and that's it. Like we and like if we see other That's it. families that like we don't see two families at the same time because the group gets too big. And so it's, you know, how do you explore um, the dynamic of, of social connections? When social you don't connections. Have, um, you don't have the physicality behind it. Yeah, there's some interesting things there. Um, I, I chatted to Tim Harris, who I, I believe you know, uh, the CEO at Westgrove. And he was saying that they've hired um, for his team uh, a psychologist, a sociologist, or an anthropologist, uh, a combination of those, to help them understand the neuroscience of engaging with their team without the physical nature of touch and what it does to your stress levels. Because you're seeing people respond in certain ways, but your body isn't feeling how their body is responding. So it's it's giving you this mental fatigue that you're unused to because you're in meetings day after day after day without actually engaging with people's physicality. And I think that does speak to what social networks will be in the future. And then the other thing that's intriguing for me is the world is getting smaller, but now with COVID, it's shrunk. So instead of everything being accessible, it's so small that nothing is accessible. Um, and how does that change the nature of social networks? Like I, I've got friends in Berlin that I can't fly to, but I still don't hang out with them on yeah. Zoom. What what does oh, that no, do? I, yeah. I think like, oh, very I think, interesting. Um, existing connections are something which is less of an issue because you can just connect when you need to and people understand the world you're in but like imagine going through this gap where you made no friends and no new people for a year or two maybe right and how does that impact you know how does it impact Jeez, us? Yeah. and also how does it like advance us how do we learn i mean i i'd like to say you know every year i make new friends mm. and stuff and imagine a year or two is just no new connections and and all connections fade but it's interesting i can I, yeah. let's see what happens the next uh, year or so but I, those are the things i'm thinking about Feels like a whole nother podcast. Um, when <laughs> when you are starting something, uh, I, I mean, generally you've started with co-founders. If I'm I've not mistaken, have you ever done anything on your own? Uh, to some extent, yeah. Maybe maybe like minor roles or whatever. I always have people that I work with. I'm a big fan of like having at least one co-founder in a business. Um, I think you know, three is three is actually not bad. So you know, two or three is good. Uh, more than three is insane. You can't have four people in a, in a, in a startup. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah, agreed. Too much clashing. I think the only yeah, people I've seen do that I right is your most, code. The most, uh, um, even the most impressive founders can can use a co-founder in their business. So uh, I, I'm a big fan of two or three. Yeah, people. and yeah, same. And when you start out with these people, do you very clearly define what success and failure look like when you start, or do you just get going? You know, I, 
I try and start off with uh, a view of like what's the product and hypothesis we're trying to test and let's go from there. And you can't predict things in a startup. You always use that. Look, st startups are, there's different types of startups. There's a startup that's building something for an existing market. You're building for a, a zero to one sort of new market type business. And so depending on what you're trying to do, you have different outcomes. And so if you have a zero to one approach, it's really more about hypothesis testing. You know, if it's a one to two approach and, and zero to one, I'm referring to the book Peter Thiel wrote zero to one. So he, people should, all, everyone should read that. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking like for an incremental approach, like, hey, yeah. you know, I'm going to start selling coffee mugs and this one's going to have it uh, insulated, uh, you know, so sort of internal part, it keeps the coffee warm and it's going to be a better weighted and dishwasher safe. And, 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 and that's a different business because there's an existing market. There's five million coffee cups sold every single year, average price of $12 in the U S you know, you're going to come in at great. You're going to capture some market share for people who are price sensitive. Can you make the same quality for that price? Like those are the things you start calculating because you're going to go after And now then it's about distribution and price and promotion and all those other things. Right. Um, that's different business to like, Hey, I got this idea for a new video social network. You know, that I think everyone's going to love. Well, how do you know they're going to love? Well, I'm going to run a test. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, what do you need to do to run a test? Do you have to build an MVP? Okay. How long is that going to take? Three months. So great. MVP. Now, who do we test it with? Who's the audience? Like that's unknown unknowns. And this is known knowns. Mm -hmm. And so it's a different business. Yeah. Makes sense to me. Cool. Um, so having both of us started so many startups in the last 20 years, uh, the thing I'm very conscious of is people always think from the outside that it's it's a gift. Being an entrepreneur is a gift. You get to be your own boss. Everything's easy. You get your own leave. Um, so <laughs> the question is, yeah, what the fuck is leave? I don't know. Um, what challenges have you faced that people would find unexpected? Unexpected me or unexpected entrepreneurial journeys? A bit of both, uh, depending on how much you want to give away, but either or. Um, interesting. Uh, I think you. what's unexpected is the amount of time you spend on planes, generally, traveling. Yeah, as I'm traveling. For me, planes? Like, <laughs> so, so, Shit, that so is not so year, true. I did 5,000 so BA points, which is gold guest list, which is like the highest tier you get. But in the same year, I was also Southwest Companion, <laughs> so which is like 50 flights in Southwest. Um, so like last year, I think I did somewhere between 80 and a hundred flights in a year. So last year, I think you and I saw each other or maybe two years ago in a hotel room in Cape yeah. town and recorded another podcast and off air, you told me that your doctors had warned you that you need to stay in a single time zone so that your sleep can adjust because yeah, you I weren't digesting food properly. Yeah, that is so some the, the, the radiation stuff, you man. get from pl flying at like 36,000 feet is not insignificant and it can actually disrupt your, and then your, your circadian rhythm cycles get disrupted. So I was traveling and when I saw you, that was the year my mom died uh, in 2018. And so when I, when I mm. saw you, like, yeah. I remember like very clearly, like the, the, the flight path was, I went to South Africa in February for the funeral. I came back and then I, I came back to California. Then I flew over to Ireland. I came back and then I went to Germany and then like this is and then I went to then I went to Japan and I went to and then I, yeah Cape Town, exactly and then and from Japan to Cape Town Japan. I but like I was just really sick um and actually you know eventually I moved on to San Diego mm. and I started traveling this and my body's largely healed itself so I mean what happened was I actually had an ulcer so my mom died and also from um from the stress and whatever else and then I went on yeah, and then I went on. I get ulcers uh, from stress. Proton yeah. pump inhibitors, which is antacids, which basically then created a bacterial overgrowth, and then combined combined with the travel and the <laughs> eating schedule, I, you know, because I was eating at different odd times, I was feeding the bacteria more and more, and then like, it, it was just a, a downward spiral. But it's taken me, you know, better part of two years. I, I'm, I'd say ninety five percent healed. I have like minor issues. I was Entrepreneurship is glamorous, Vinny. Like twenty tons a day. It was insane just to keep the oh. acid down. And the problem is like when you go on those meds and try and get back off it is insane. But anyway, like just cutting down all my travel, yeah. this, like COVID for me has been a gift in some sense. And I, I feel sorry for all the people who have died from it, but I just stayed at home. I haven't been on a flight since March. Very, very happy. Very happy not to have flight for like six yeah. months. Like for someone yeah. who flies a hundred flights a year, it's a gift. 
Jeez, dude, that's crazy. Um, you know, speaking of uh, Japan, it's uh, something that I love to ask my guests is about the concept of ikigai. Have you come across it? The reason for being? Do you do you believe that, that there is a reason for being, that everyone has got a vocation? Or do you kind of believe you scramble through life with whatever yeah, opportunity presents itself? I'm a deep itself? believer in uh, there's a higher consciousness in the world. And I believe that um, there is... Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to say everyone has, uh, you know, the ability to reach that high, highest state of consciousness because it's clearly not true. <laughs> <You know? laughs> not <putting> <laughs> yeah, your president says so. In but, fact, both but, of our presidents, I the, think, the, are the that. The point I'm trying to make is, I think, uh, like, there is a path to a high consciousness for everyone in in in, in this life and maybe the next. So, have you have you you view um, your consciousness? And it's really incumbent upon us to, to, to believe to some extent in, in, in a higher purpose. And because it, it, it's an interesting, um, there's actually, I forgot what it's called. There's actually a, a thing as Pascal's Wager, it's called. Um, um, I was yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a philosophical argument, Blaise Pascal. Basically, you know, the, the, the it's effectively a mathematical formula to some extent that like it's better to believe in God or a higher consciousness than not because if you're wrong the the you know the, the outcome is like well <laughs> yes. you know, so let's say it is and you don't believe it it's kind of worse because you, you know, but like it's, again, like, I don't give the whole religious yeah. arguments on which God etc it's not about that it's about you know let's believe that there's a higher consciousness and you're trying to reach that because if if there the, if isn't and you don't get there it wouldn't have made a difference but if there is and you do get there the outcome is a thousand x you're winning so you're winning and from my yes yeah it's spoken so, like a good investor but he... on the upside and zero downside <laughs> okay when i say zero downside it's like what's yeah. the point of saying there's no higher consciousness like okay fine but enough of the world believes that there is yeah. one and there's enough people out there, whether it's through religious or through meditation or whatever, believe that you can reach a higher level of consciousness. And and I think in my life, I've personally seen my, my, my growth towards a higher consciousness over time where I didn't believe in it when I was younger. And then I see it emerging in my life in a way which, you know, Steve Jobs for me was a huge, huge um, uh, inspiration. And one of the things he said was, you can only connect the dots going backwards, not forwards. And as, as I get older, I'm able to connect the dots yeah. going backwards. And the older you get, the more you're able to do that. And so it's, it's a perspective, but it's not for everyone because some people just, you, you, you're, your thinking's too linear and you're never gonna get there. And then do whatever makes you happy. So if it makes you happy not believing in the higher consciousness, then don't believe in one, it doesn't affect anyone else. But if you think there's something more out there, be curious about it and try and evolve your thinking to the point where you can absorb those the, those energies and, and and it can be very fulfilling. Yeah. Hey, look, Steve Jobs is also the guy who said that he doesn't trust anybody who's never dropped acid, and I back that theory. <laughs> I back that theory. <laughs> I think that's a part of direct <laughs> consciousness right there. Yeah, I love that. Um, okay, so I'm trying to um, help younger entrepreneurs uh, rid themselves of what I call the sacrifice fallacy. It's the concept that you have to sacrifice your mental and physical well-being to build something. Yeah, I think you have. What's your take on I that? I think in the beginning, in the beginning of the early days, you have to. I think it's, it's, when, when I say there's a sacrifice, I don't, I don't think it is um, permanent. But there are certain moments in the ebb and flow where you have to make a decision. And, we, and and the difficult part is when when it flows the other way to get back on the horse and get back on the journey. You'll see behind me. I've got the pedal. The so I've got a I've got a, a rowing machine in my office, and I've got a pedal. So oh, I'm so jealous of the rowing yeah, machine. I, I got an elliptical so, at home. Uh, you know, for me, that and that machine behind me is a weights machine, right? So up to 100 pounds per arm, and I can move the arms up and down, extended, etc. That for me is. It's really important that you keep your, 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 your body and your mind, you know, fit and healthy to whatever degree you want to, right? And, and so the difficult part about being an entrepreneur is you're so tired at the end of a, a sprint, effectively, 
that you're like, I just don't feel like getting in on doing it. And then you can do two things. You can go for a nice walk, you can go for an hour or two walk, or you can get some light exercise, or you can go heavy and do some weights. But the difficult part is when you're out of energy and you and you just like stressed out to get back in the in the flow and and and, and. but the, the point is don't expect like I would go and travel for like three weeks where I wouldn't see the inside of a gym for three weeks and that was like you know tough because I'm on different time zones different flights I got a pack schedule you know and are you tired and then you get back and you're tired and so I I used to have a personal trainer yeah. before COVID uh, I've had a personal trainer for like maybe five or six years now seven years. But the reason for it is the moment I'm coming back, my assistant or I'm booking those times back in with my with my trainer, Monday, first thing. Because remember, when you come back to the West Coast, you're jet lagged. So I wake up at 4 a.m., 5 a.m. anyway. So at least I know 7 a.m. I'm back in the gym. I've Oof. taken meetings yeah. in the gym. I've done like, you know, but I make sure when I'm back home, I'm training the best way to get back on the track. Because this is the problem with the mm. air flow is that it, you know, if, if you don't get back on the horse, literally, it basically is... A, it's a downward spiral, but you have to accept okay. there's certain times where you just can't train and you can't be fit and healthy. And so you've got to balance. That's the, the balance isn't in like balance. It's in keeping the ebb and flow, ebbing and flowing. And yes. Yes. And recognizing that. It, but like much like anything yeah. in our lives as entrepreneurs, it's feast or famine, right? Like you're working full on on your startup or you're not. You're working oh, on the exercise or you're not. Like there's no, way, right? there really is very little in between. To your fitness and your health, you you won't be as effective in your business because now we're going back to the time fallacy. So the, the time fallacy is where entrepreneurs fall, uh, fall down. They believe that more time in their business is more results. So, but it's the quality of the time that you spend mm-hmm. in your business. It's the it's the 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 the, the focus and the peace of mind you have. And and, and so. In a business, when you're doing repetitive tasks, time is a factor. In a startup, founders often have to do repetitive tasks because they're the only ones who can. They can't afford anyone else. Then, you, then you're sacrificing your time to do repetitive yes. tasks that aren't going to grow you as a founder. So what I always do in a, in, a, in a startup is one of the first hires is an assistant, right? Like you have, you have, to, you have to have an assistant do yeah. some of these repetitive tasks, scheduling, et cetera, et cetera, to give you more time to do higher functioning things. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. It's what I've uh, at, at the back of the sacrifice fallacy is the concept that we believe that entrepreneurs need to be at the bottom of our priority yeah. list. But actually, the truth is we need to be at the top because no one wants to work with an unfit, unhealthy, unslept, unrested yeah. person because I mean, you are worse at your job. As an example, like, really even simple. while I was traveling, I think in 2008, when I saw you, um, I actually hit my, 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 my personal records in the gym. I was like leg pressing 850 pounds, uh, which is about four seven kilos which, which is like you know in my wow. age a great personal personal yeah. record but that in between all this travel that i'm yeah. doing because when i get back at the gym if i'm back at home for three or four weeks i can go and say okay in the next four weeks i want to get up to this level and i work hard and then i go take three weeks off and you know it's okay um but you you've you've, you've got to at least do something on the, on the I, I i you know and i've fallen in the trap where i like i you know put on a ton of weight to traveling stressed out work i fall in these traps like i'm speaking from experience mm-hmm. at one stage i was a hundred and like in kilo uh, yep. pounds of 270 pounds nearly okay and that's like 120 something kilos uh and now yes. like, down like, no, thanks wow. so now it's like well you're looking fit and healthy now and so losing like 40 pounds is huge when you, but but you know, yeah. doing it is, uh, you know, at the, when I got sick of my mom and everything else, it was important that I I, I focus on my health because like you know you only have one body and you've got to like just you know get mm. healthy. Um, so, yeah, we haven't solved that uh, immortality know. thing yet. No. <laughs> okay. So um, final two questions. The the, the next one might. Uh, require a little bit of thinking and you might not have one that's cool but what one thing has happened to you that you wouldn't want to repeat but that you're grateful for i think my first failure um in business is probably one of those things that you yeah like well actually take a step back dropping out of university uh was a really tough emotional psychological thing for me in my third year it just largely wasn't my fault you know i had finished got all my okay. credits i was doing fine i was top of my class for information systems uh, and it was a really tough couple of years to get over that. I think it probably took me maybe five to 10 years psychologically to get over that. Because of the no, ego attached to finishing or what was it? I was, really, I, was, I had a good circle of friends. I had a good, okay. 
you know, I was living in Cape Town. I was just, life was good. This is late nineties, right? It was a, it was a amazing time. And, uh, mm. and you know, but it made me stronger. It made me, it turned me from a, an academic to an entrepreneur. So, you know, whether by, by, whether I would have gotten there, I, I probably would have been there anyway, but I would have loved to have done like my final year. I would love to have maybe done an honors degree, maybe even a master's, but it would have kept me in the sort of academic world for too long and wouldn't have given me the skills to do what I do today. So I wouldn't change it, but that's one thing I do regret. Like I could have had an extra year or two of varsity with my friends and, and, and whatever else. It would have been great, but that's life. Yeah. Okay. And then um, this is more advice giving. Uh, what do you wish someone had told you when you were just starting out as an Actually, entrepreneur? I, I, this is an interesting one. I wouldn't have... I think I got all the advice I needed. I just didn't listen to it. I just didn't listen to it. Okay. So, so <laughs> ah, if, well if said. If that was my problem too. Forced me or told me to do is listen to the people you, you should respect, the people who have been there to some extent and just take some, I don't think you can re, like recreate or change the, the laws of, of society and nature and money and just listen to people. Like listen to people like me <laughs> who've been there, done it and listen to the advice that I'm giving. Who's exactly. lost their hair, who have the stomach ulcers. Give you some guidance. Yeah. Don't try and, yeah. don't make the same mistakes they made. And that's kind of like, it's funny. Because like, I got all this advice when I was a kid. Yeah, I just didn't spot on. Yeah. And the advice hasn't changed, eh? The advice yeah. that I give yeah. to entrepreneurs is the advice oh, I got 20 years advice ago. When I was like, you know, in like uh, late yeah. 90s, and I just didn't listen to him. It's like, well, you know, and, you know, eventually, hey, eventually you invested one of my companies. What do you know? I'm going to go this you way. Know, I, I probably should listen to him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then in closing, uh, where can people find you, follow you, and what do you want to tell them to go and view? So go to Twitter. At, at go ahead. Twitter, the floor is yours. On Twitter. That's kind of my, um, my hangout spot for insights and whatever else. I'm always happy to engage. But I'm sure there'll be a new social network at some point that I'll be excited about, and I'll, I'll join that. But, um, you know, I, I'm not really on Facebook much. Uh, I'm not really on much anything else. Um, so it's mainly Twitter. Perfect. Vinny, thank you so much for your time. It's always enthralling talking to you. And I'm sure that my guests got, my listeners got a thanks, lot of value out of it. So yeah, thanks, man. Awesome.